Apparently, you guys want me to talk about this. Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglies Guitar Show. Les Paul number one is coming up for auction, and everybody wants me to talk about it. So I'm happy to oblige. Okay, so if you haven't seen this news get broken, it's been on like pretty much any type of main gear news type thing. This article just happens to be from Premier Guitar. So this is being promoted as the very first Les Paul that has ever been made, the one that won over Les's endorsement in general, and has been heavily modified and used by him over the years. So before we actually look at this guitar, let's know a little bit more about its history. So first off, this is being sold by Les Paul's son, Gene Paul. I didn't even know he had kids. <laughs> Apparently there's four. You've got Gene, Russell, Robert, and Colleen. I never really took much time to dive into his personal life. Like, I didn't even realize he was married before Mary Ford. But from 1938 to 49, he was married to Virginia Webb. And then Mary Ford and that relationship ended in 1964, right around that exact same time that the Les Paul name was dropped from the SG, or what we now call the SG. A lot of people say it's because Les didn't like his name on it. Some people say it had to do to contract timing. I've heard stories that he just didn't want to give the money to Mary. Whatever the truth is, the rest is history. So as far as the lineage, it seems to be okay. It's by Gene Paul, one of his sons, and Tom Doyle, a longtime guitar builder, engineer, and producer. He's very active in guitar forums. You can find him on Facebook groups as well. He's out there if you have questions about it. So as far as doubting the authenticity of this guitar, definitely not a problem in my eyes. All right, so let's go ahead and take a look at this. It's very familiar to what you would normally see on a 1952 Les Paul. This is what a production one looked like. You'd have two P90 pickups, a pick guard, individual volume and tone control positions, with the underwrapped tailpiece because of a design flaw. It was initially meant to be overwrapped so you could do the palm muting, but the story goes they forgot to take into account the carve of the body. You know, it's a arch top right here. So these have to be underwrapped. So as far as playability, these things have never been super popular. They're more so just collector's guitars, and that's why 52s are actually the cheapest out of all the 50s Les Paul guitars made. Most 52s end up getting converted to burst specs and getting the neck angle corrected because of the fact that they're cheaper so people can make burst clones using real 50s woods for a lot less than spending a quarter million dollars on an original. However, the very earliest ones made looked like this. They were mounted with two diagonal screws in the bridge P90 pickup and they did not have neck binding. If I was going to own a 52, it'd be one of these things. They're just cool. So let's take a look at this one. Curiously enough, it does have binding and it does not have the diagonal mounting screws. So personally to me, that kind of muddies up the history. Is this actually the first Les Paul like they're advertising it as? Or was it his number one? Eric Ernest actually jumped in in the conversation on this Facebook group. He is a very reputable guy when it comes to 50s Les Pauls. He knows his stuff and before that. Like, if you need help authenticating a true vintage guitar, go to this guy. And it looks like he provided this to the first two Les Pauls that Les and Mary had. None of these had binding. In this photo, we can actually see Mary Ford with one that's very similar to this one. Not exactly the same, but it doesn't have binding. So did this one predate this one? Because it's got, I think it was that ES-150 tailpiece. And it apparently left the factory with four controls on the front with a similar neck pickup. So does that mean this is not actually the first Les Paul like people are saying it is? Maybe. I mean, at the same time, who's to say that it didn't start life like this and then they decided not to do the binding and to mount the bridge pickup differently. And then after a few of them were produced, they decided to go back to this. So perhaps that's why number one is in half quotation marks, I guess. <laughs> on Tom Doyle's channel, there's even a video on this guitar. And if you watch through it, he says he called it his number one. So I think that's proof right there that it's not meant to be advertised as the first one. And it's more so people just taking that kind of out of context. Maybe the auction should clarify a little bit more on that. But I do think we can all agree that this is one of the earliest ones, and it's one that he had a lot of modifications done to. Like, there was a Les Paul Custom floating around a couple of years ago that he did very similar mods to. But it appears this might be the actual guitar that he used in the video for How High the Moon. Because you can see things like the top output jack right here, this the two volume controls. This one does indeed have the binding and it's got the trim bar on it, but it had not quite had some of the additional routings done to it yet. 
So things are looking good as far as his number one, despite him not actually preferring neck binding, I've heard. But anyways, controversy aside, let's actually take a look at what modifications have been done here. So the first thing you're going to notice here is our neck pickup has been Frankensteined. So it's like it started life as a P90, but then he added like a single coil pickup underneath here is what it looks like. Because you've got the pole pieces right here. It kind of reminds me of, I think it's called a Dynasonic pickup. Some Gretsch guitars use something like this. D'Armin makes a very similar pickup. It's kind of like the staple Alnico 5s, except for a little bit different. I'll be honest, I don't know a lot about these because I've never ran into one in the wild. But that is exactly what that's looking like. So as far as what that pickup sounds like, maybe look into one of these. It might sound similar, but that certainly looks familiar anyways. All right. But our bridge pickup, it seems to be OK, but our pick guard is here. But then we have a another one right here. So Les was famous for doing stuff like that. He would route these guitars out, add third pickups, do a bunch of other stuff hidden in between. So this one is a dummy. And what I mean by that is <laughs> there's a dummy coil in here. So he utilizes these dummy coils, very similar to what Gibson did on the Blues Hawk series. So there's another coil in here that kind of makes this into a humbucker. It gets rid of the hum in a magic way. So at the time of recording this video, he had not quite routed that guitar up quite yet. But that's what he has screwed down into there. It's to make the pickups not hum anymore because he was always about a very clean, pure tone. He didn't want any of that stuff in there. But moving on from here, we can see there's actually a metal bridge loaded onto what looks like an ABR-1 stud. I mean, you gotta remember, electric guitars were pretty darn new at this time, so he's probably just using stuff that he had in his parts drawer, and that basic bridge that resembles some of them wooden bridges that'd be used that were non-intonatable just happened to work for him. But then moving on to our tremolo arm, I've never seen one of those things before. It looks freaky and vintage and pretty darn cool though. And if you want to buy a vintage correct one, they're pretty expensive. Here's one that sold for around 600 bucks. They were used on some Rickenbacker guitars, but they're called a Kaufman Vibrola. So this is what it looks like when you take it off of a guitar. It's a very primitive looking technology, but all the coolest looking Vibrola arms usually are. But it was invented by Doc Kaufman. And he was a lap steel guitar player, did some electric guitar engineering, and this is patented as the first guitar vibrola. <laughs> I guess they titled it Apparatus for Producing Tremolo Effects. And wow, that was all the way back in 1928. But he didn't get that granted until 1932. Okay, and apparently that was around the time that he and Les were friends in the 30s. So we used that on his very famous prototype log guitar, and then apparently it made it onto this Les Paul eventually too. Now, I'm not sure if that's the exact Vibrola that was like very early prototype stages, but I think it's fair to assume it's probably one of the earlier ones that he just had on a different guitar that he threw onto here, maybe. But it looks like you put the ball end of the strings right here, and then it wraps under and then over top of the bridge. So it's kind of just like a traditional tailpiece, and then somehow you compress springs and it creates a little warble effect. Okay. And that just mounts to the bottom with three screws. And then it's a plate right here that they link that together. And then I, I'll be honest, I don't know what's going on under here, but it looks like some springs are getting compressed and that's screwed maybe into the top to keep that secure. Interesting to say the least. But now we go to our controls here. One, two output jacks, two chicken head knobs, and a, I, I don't know what that is. It looks like just a small knob. I guess we could assume these are maybe volume controls and a master tone, but what's going on here? Two output jacks. Like, I've seen that before, but generally, you, you don't put this gigantic of a jack plate in its place. All right, so this is one you can actually answer by looking into the future a little bit when the Les Paul recording model came out in the 70s. You could actually go back to the late 60s if you go for the personal model or the professional but less liked very clean and direct tones. So one of these, you can take it into your amplifier. The other one just went directly into his recording interface so he could get a true, pure, clean signal. So there is a use for having two output jacks on this thing. And this photo right here shows this guitar and I believe him using it like that. So this is going directly into all this stuff for a nice clean sound. He didn't actually have to mic up his amp so he could do all of his multi-tracking very easily. That's what gives you that signature Les Paul sound. But you will see in this photo, here's another difference between some mods he did later on. So there were no dummy coils yet, and he moved the output jack from this location to this location. So this whole guitar actually started life 
potentially is just a two knobber, maybe a three. So that definitely tells you that was one of the earlier ones. Yeah, that doesn't even line up perfectly. I'm just now seeing that because on a traditional Les Paul, it would be like right here-ish. So he definitely did that route himself. And from the factory, it seems like the output jack would have been right here, but he wanted a tone or whatever that is. And this one has a beautiful dish carve to it. Like you can see just how far down it comes and then it goes with a little bit of a belly, but yet it seems really flat up here. Maybe that's just the angle, but you've got some nice finish checking on this. It was not abused by any means. Well, <laughs> When I say not abused, I mean not abused like as far as sanding the finish off wise. I mean, look at the back of this thing. This is just beautiful. I am so happy that they did this because this will actually answer some more questions for us. So we can see where how the cavity kind of started and then he enlarged it right here. And it looks like for the toggle switch, is that a second dummy coil? Did he have to have two of those for each pickup? Or is that just part of the construction? Like the three-way toggle switch somehow has to be in there as well, but you can't quite see it. But this back plate actually looks like maybe it left the factory similar to that, or he just had some really professional router bits. And this is purely just speculative. I, I don't really know for sure, but I'm, I'm judging that based on the fact that we actually have a shelf right here for things to screw into. Maybe he knew how to do that himself. But what I find interesting is it looks like we have rotary switches in here so perhaps instead of this being a tone it's actually like a second pickup selector that gets some different tonalities like in and out of phase or it turns on the dummy coil it turns it off but at the same time things don't line up we've got one two three four five five things in here but one two three four <laughs> what has he got hiding in here so these are the two chicken head knobs because they're on the outer edge. This will be whatever this thing is. And then that's the output jack. So whatever he has hidden in here might actually be some sort of a transformer. Because from the knowledge I know of the recording Les Pauls, you would have some sort of a transformer in the guitar that would allow you to use the high Z output in order to put it into your amp. So that might be what that is, but only time will tell what this thing does. But besides this wizardry back here, let's just appreciate the nice mahogany wood grain. It's not quite a dark back, but it's got some good colors to it. You can tell he had some sort of a belt buckle on at one point in time. He's got some scratches on it. Or maybe that just happened when he had stuff laying on it and was modifying these things. He's known as a tinkerer for a reason. But what I'm really curious about is why this much extra space? What did he have in here at one point in time that he needed that? I mean, this wire right here is probably the grounding wire, I would guess, for the trem system. And I couldn't find any really good close-ups of the headstock here, but zooming in, it looks like it's in actually pretty good shape. It even still has the original case, and all things considered, it actually appears to be in pretty clean shape for its age. And it's most definitely been refretted. Now you can make the argument, no, the fret nibs were just really small. They've naturally worn off. The frets are definitely larger than stock. And it looks like they've got some significant wear too. Les was a fantastic player up and down the neck. So it wouldn't surprise me if this thing needed new frets. So at the end of the day, this is a very iconic guitar. Was it the very first Les Paul? I'm starting to doubt that, but it does appear to be a very early one that Les used himself quite a bit and modified. So the big question is, how much is this actually going to bring in auction? Because knowing what I know about 52s, they really don't sell for that much. A really clean one, maybe 18,000. One of the very first runs, I don't know what, between 25 to 40, depending on how much somebody wants to pay and the condition of it. So I've been seeing people talk about, oh, this is gonna reach millions and millions. I'm not sure if it will. I would say that the best guitar we have to compare this to would actually be this one that Tom Doyle showed us once before. His early black Les Paul Custom that had the low impedance pickups put into it. Because it had very similar modifications done to it. Now granted, this one maybe not as iconic because it wasn't used in a very popular music video. But this was like the precursor to his professional model that became the recording. So that's pretty iconic. It had a very similar dummy coil system put into it a little bit more professional of a bridge. And he seemed to opt for the Bigsby tremolo on this one. 
but that one sold back in 2015 for $335,000. So we can kind of use that as a base off of what this is. That wasn't an early Les Paul prototype, but it was kind of cool for what it represented in the future. So I think realistically, we can probably expect this Les Paul to bring maybe between 500 to 600,000. Now there might be a bidding war for this particular one because it is a little bit more iconic, but if we're being grounded in reality here, you know, anywhere between 400 to 600 is what I would estimate it at. Because that Black Beauty prototype was speculated between 900,000 to $2 million and it didn't quite get there. And there are tons of guitars out there that Les has modded, but this one I would argue is a little bit more iconic. So people saying this one being worth millions, I don't personally see it. I think we'll be shocked about how much this will sell for. It is iconic, but is it iconic enough for somebody to shell out all that money? I think we'll see close to burst money for this simply because this auction's getting really hyped up and it is a very early Les Paul prototype. But to see it go for more than 250, I, I I don't know. But I certainly hope that the auction proves me wrong and this gets millions of dollars. But we'll see. We'll see on this one. I'd be interested to hear your guys' thoughts and opinions of it. A lot of people are saying Joe Bonamassa is going to buy it. That would be cool to see him on stage playing it. That'd be very fitting to see this thing in action again. And I'm sure he'd get some good publicity for that. But we will find out in what they're calling the exceptional sale on October 13th. This is part of like a different auction. I don't know if there's going to be other guitars. At this point in time of reporting on this, all the lots and listings aren't public. So is this a guitar worthy of review and demo? It's going to fall outside of my budget range. I can guarantee you guys that. It would be fun to review and document it. But at the end of the day, I don't think I'd be able to do justice to this thing. And I'm sure a lot of people would get upset that I would take it apart, despite it clearly already being taken apart after Les's passing. But at the end of the day, I'm glad this thing has now surfaced and we have good photos of it. Because I've had people ask me about this guitar so many times and it's like, there's only so much I could really say about it. But now that we've got current day photos, it's so much easier to talk about. So, troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.